If you want to build a mine anywhere in the world, you come to Toronto to find the money to build it. Well, if that's the case, then if you're in mining investment, you've just hit the big time. Because you can price your labor in a global market. And if, if you're pricing your labor in a global market, you can go to New York, you can go to Chicago, you can go to, to Paris or London. Well, not Paris, because they don't do mining so well in Paris. But you can go <laughs> Sydney, Australia, you go, right? So you can price your labor in a global market, and you think to yourself, if they want me to stay in Toronto, they got to stump up. So that's why people get paid seven figures to do mining investment in Toronto. And let's not begrudge them. I mean, those, that mining investment helps to produce jobs for lots of Canadians. So we have a global market in labor. We have a global market in high skills. If you've got a kid who's good in math and is really good at algorithms, he goes down to the stock exchange and can do trading models using highly mathematical concepts, that kid can make seven, eight figures very fast because the whole world wants that kid, right? That's one of the reasons we're getting these inequalities. So we have technological change, and that also is producing huge returns. Mr. Balsili and Mr. Lazaridis had a really good idea, a really good idea. It's not, it's having a bit of trouble now, but it's a really good idea. And they made a huge amount of money. And I'm not sure Canadians begrudge their success. Partly also because they can employ lots of people. So these are some of the stories that you would tell that explain why inequality is growing. A globalization of labor market, enormous re returns to certain kinds of skills, right? And so some of it seems okay to us. And we also know that these returns to high incomes are returns not for clipping coupons, for just sitting on your duff and cashing in, most of these people are working 70, 80 hours a week. That's one of the new things about this new inequality. They're some of the hardest working people in our societies. So that also makes it complicated. You think, okay, these guys are working hard. And I'm saying guys, it's mostly guys. A lot of women are now benefiting, but it's still the same old inequalities are playing here. So you've got a complicated picture. They can price their labor on the international market. They're often doing something that commands a very high price because they've got special skills. And they work really hard. So you think to yourself, what kind of moral problem do we have here? They're doing well. Why should we have a society that begrudges them their success? I'm trying to make the best possible case for these folks, right? Because I think, you know, I'm a liberal. I want to be fair and... You know, but I'm also doing it for a reason, which is unless you understand what's going on, you could, you could get things badly wrong. You don't want to kill the goose that lays the golden eggs, for one thing, right? These people are generating wealth and jobs for the whole economy, and that's part of their moral rationale for the returns that they make. So those are some of the things that are, that are happening. And then we have to come back to my question, so what's the problem here? I've identified one problem, which is people kind of seceding from the common life. They don't ride the subway downtown, they've got a car, comes to their house. So they're never in the common life. Their kids don't go to the local school. They're not in the common life. So they don't really care about the public services that are delivered. They're kind of semi-detached from Canadian life. What kind of a problem is that? It might be a problem. So we have to think about that as an issue. There's also the issue about whether the economic power that they have converts into political power. Does it give them voice? Does it give them access? Does it give them the capacity to bend regulations that will favor their businesses? 
And we've got a lot of things in Canada that try and make sure that money talks but it doesn't scream in Canadian life, right? Bob Dylan said, you know, money doesn't talk, it screams. Money always talks, but you don't want it to scream. And you don't want money to silence everybody else. And so you want to have a system where Mr. Balsilli lines up with the union guy when he comes to see a politician and he takes his cue in the line and he doesn't get a special, you know, you listen to everybody. You want to have a political system that's open to everybody. And then the question is whether we've got a political system which has basically been captured by very powerful interests. And this affects you. I mean, if Rogers or Bell captures the political system, you know what's going to happen to your cell phone bills, right? You know? You know what's going to happen to your internet costs. So you don't want to have a political system that's captured by the very rich or the interests that they represent because it's bad for you. Adam Smith, the great economist, famously said, two merchants never gather in a tavern, but conversation never fails to turn to restraint of trade. <laughs> you know? That is, the inherent tendency of the rich and powerful is to get more riches and power, to, to use economic power to convert it into political power, and when you've converted political power, to actually pr go from free competition to monopoly or to oligopoly. So one of the things you might want to say about a capitalist system and free competition is it'd be good to see some occasionally. <laughs> you know? I'm serious. I mean, I'm a big believer in the capitalist system, I, but I think what we all think about capitalism is we have competition. And competition keeps our prices down. Well, if you have very unequal societies where economic power translates into political power, that can convert into oligopoly, regulatory capture, to use the jargon, which makes it more difficult for us to get, have a fair economy. So those are some of the issues we might think about. We also want to think about one other issue, which is and this gets more to a subject that we'd want to talk about in this room, which is the issue of who's not in the room. Who gets excluded in this kind of society? Because one of the things I think we think about this society is those who are at the top deserve to get to the top. Because they worked harder, they're smarter, well, they worked harder and they're smarter. And so there's a tendency to moralize, to justify inequality as the natural result of talent, skill, and hard work. And one of the problems with that, I think, is not that those who are at the top don't work really hard and aren't smart. I teach some of them and it's a great privilege and they are pretty smart. And they work pretty hard. But you do want to ask yourself, who's not in the room? You know, I teach at the University of Toronto, and I'm always asking that question. Who's not in this room? The kids in front of me are the luckiest kids in the country. Not just because they're having the great experience of learning. <laughs> or from the great Peter Russell, who's here today, and who's a fantastic teacher, my former teacher. He makes me nervous just being here because I have to do a better job than I would normally. Anyway. But the point about those rooms, which is where the elite get trained, is you have to ask yourself all the time, who didn't get here? Who was just as smart, just as clever, just as talented, just as hardworking, but the game was over before they even started to play? And I think we can think of a lot of Canadians for whom that's true. And that seems to me the problem with the inequality we got, is we tend to moralize the success of those who got there and forget the people who never had a chance to play the game. And I met people like that through my wonderful time in politics. Yes, and it was wonderful, although it didn't turn out so well. <laughs> but it was wonderful because of the people I met. I went to, Susanna and I went to a high school in Winnipeg, Manitoba, 
in the north end. Those of you who know Winnipeg know that.